And if you'd like to take your Bibles and turn in them to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6 is where we will be picking up our series this morning. Will you pray with me? Father, as we go into this time that is sometimes called the season of giving, and we see the shoe boxes over here and the food pantry needs, it just reminds us that really it, it should be all season, every season, that you've called us to be generous people. And we thank you that we have that ability and opportunity because by doing so, we are imitating you. You are the one, Father, who gave your son to the world. And the son gave his life for us. Giving is a godly trait. Giving is part of your divine quality and characteristics. And it's one of those characteristics that we can also imitate. Father, I pray that you would motivate our hearts to be the kind of giving people you want us to be. We give because you gave first. We give out of gratitude to you. And Father, we pray that the gifts that we give the shoe boxes, the, the food for the food pantry might help to give the people that receive these gifts the testimony of you, that you are behind them. And that we're not just giving food or, or giving some small toys to some children, but that there's a message behind all of it. And that message is, your son, our savior, is there for them. Father, help us to be, remem uh, to, to be reminded of that, to, to remember that idea, that fact. And as we turn to your word, not only do we realize that you gave us the living word, your son, but the written word. We pray, Father, that as we open your written word now this morning, again, you will be our teacher and our guide. We look forward to the life lessons that you have for us now. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> so one of the things that we have to do as parents is to teach our children some difficult lessons. And one of those lessons is life is not always fair. Life is not always fair. I can still hear my daughter saying those words. That's not fair, Dad. <laughs> and you've probably heard those words as well as a parent. And what do you say? You say, nope, you're right. It's not fair. But you're going to have to live with it. You know, we all like the concept of justice, especially if it goes our way. But what do we do when it doesn't go our way? What do we do when life kind of throws us that, that curveball, if you will, and it's just plain unfair? Well, that, frankly, is Daniel chapter 6 in a nutshell. Now, the story of Daniel being thrown into the lion's den is probably familiar to most of us. We've heard this story maybe younger when we were in, in Sunday school. Maybe we've read parts of it. Maybe we just kind of know the general idea of that story. Many of us don't recall, though, the reason why Daniel was sentenced to being thrown in with the lions. He faced this penalty, not because he had done anything wrong. In fact, what we're going to see in the passage is it was all a setup. 
He hadn't done anything wrong. And so if anyone had the idea that this is not fair, it would certainly be Daniel in this situation. So this morning, I want to look more closely at this story. And what I want to do is as we go through it, draw out some life lessons that we can see from it. Let me begin by giving you some introductory thoughts on this, because I think we need to understand a, a, a couple of historical matters, especially. Look back uh, for into chapter 5 for just a moment. I want to read verses 30 and 31. Because this gives us the historical setting. Verse 30 in chapter 5 says, That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Now, that's going to lead us into our passage for this morning. And we read about the death of this king Belshazzar, on the very night that Babylon fell to the Medo-Persian military forces. That event led, as verse 31 says, to this man by the name of Darius, Darius the Mede, who receives the Babylonian kingdom at about the age of 62. Now we don't find it in this biblical passage but when we put it together with some other passages and then bring in secular history and what we know from secular history, what we find out was Darius was not actually the king of Persia at that point. He was a subordinate. He was under the king, the monarch, who we're going to later on find out was a man by the name of Cyrus the Great. But Darius had great authority. He was apparently given the whole area of Babylon to rule over underneath Cyrus, the Medo-Persian king. Now let's read as we begin in chapter 6, the first three verses. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now, this shows us the prominence that Daniel had at that point. We learn that one of Darius' first responsibilities was to reorganize this, this conquered land of Babylon. And he does this by appointing 120 satraps. Satraps is a Persian idea, a Persian word. It meant officials that were over various aspects or sections of a kingdom. And so he appoints these 120 satraps and then, in this whole scheme of delegation, 120 is a lot of people to, to, to report to just one person. He divides them up, apparently, and there's three administrators to oversee all these satraps. And then the passage tells us that Daniel is one of them. I think it's likely that Daniel probably had around 40 of these satraps who would be reportable to him. We also know, as we put together the chronology and the scheme here, that Daniel is about 80 years old at this point. He's very experienced. He's exceptional in what he has done for many of those years. And so the king even planned to promote him maybe over those administrators as well. Now let me stop there for just a moment because I think this leads to our first life lesson. And the life lesson goes like this. Every Christian is called by God to do their very best in whatever role or job they find themselves 
as a testimony of their faith and to the glory of God. Now, I hope you've been told that before. I hope that's not new to you this morning. But this passage just shows it again, that Daniel throughout his life, and the scriptures testify to it here, that he had exceptional qualities. That Daniel did his very best, always his very best. What we're going to find is that because of that, there's also going to be some consequences. But it's a call to every Christian, every believer, to whatever your job is, to do your very best whether it's a small task, whether it's a big one, whether it's a temporary job or whether it's a career, whatever it is that God has called you to do, you need to do your very best. That's what God would want from you in terms of your excellence. Now that leads us secondly to a plot. It's a plot of some leaders. And we pick up the story in verse 4. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. And they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the edict that Anyone who prays to any God or human or human being during the next 30 days, except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, we might have thought that respect for Daniel's age, for his experience, for his, his expertise and the great job that he had done for so many years would have brought maybe some praise from these administrators and these satraps. <laughs> but the opposite is true. They made every attempt to undermine him and to accuse him and to set him up for failure. And yet the passage says that they couldn't find any evidence. I mean, they were looking apparently under every rock for corruption or negligence or anything. They wanted something to take to Darius to be able to accuse him of. And they couldn't find anything. Now let me pause there for just a moment before we go on because it leads me to a second life lesson. And the second life lesson is this. It's a call to personal integrity. See, just as Daniel was faithful in his work and pure in his personal life, so every Christian is called by God to live a life of integrity. Someone has said rightfully that integrity is what you do in the dark. Integrity is what you're like when nobody else is watching you. Integrity is so important to God. And in this case, Daniel had that kind of integrity. I mean, they, they, they must have looked into every part of Daniel's life. They were looking into his personal life, his professional life. They were looking for any bribe, any corruption, any negligence that this 80-year-old man had done. They couldn't find anything, not anything. And it speaks to Daniel's integrity 
And it says something to us as well. That we need to have that same kind of integrity in our lives. Now as we continue on with the plot, they're unable to find any fault. And so they initiate a plan that would pit Daniel's religious convictions against the Medo-Persian government. And so they hatched this plan. They go before Darius, and they told him that, look, all of the government officials, subordinates, we've gotten together, we've all agreed to disallow the worship of anyone except you, Darius, isn't that convenient, except you, Darius, for the next 30 days. Now, how can Darius turn that down? What a, what a nice compliment. And they added that, well, if there is anyone who doesn't do that, by the way, let's make a penalty for those violators, and that penalty is to throw them into that, that pit, that den that's got all those hungry lions in it. Now, of course, they lied when they told Darius that all the officials had consented to this, because they must have left Daniel out of that little discussion. And then these vengeful officials urged Darius to sign this document into law, which he did. And if you've ever heard of the law of the Medes and Persians, if anyone has ever told you that this is like the law of the Medes and the Persians, that means once it's written, it can't be changed. It's irrevocable. <laughs> and so our passage says that as well. That was Persian policy. That was the way it was. It could not ever be rescinded. The law of the Medes and Persians. Well, that brings us to the third thing that we see in our passage, and that's the prayer of Daniel. Verses 10 and 11. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. Now the decree has been signed. It's been signed into law by Darius. Now it becomes public knowledge. It apparently is, is read. It's published in some way. But what's Daniel do? Daniel follows his usual practice. Three times a day, he was going to go to his private room. He was going to pray. That's what he did every day. He might have done that every day his entire life. And so nothing changed for Daniel. I mean, okay, Darius, you can put out these decrees. That's not going to change what I believe in and do. And I want you to also notice the content here of his prayer. It's very brief. It says thanksgiving. The first thing that he does is to give thanks to God. I don't think it was just thanks over this situation. I think that was just standard. That when Daniel went before God in prayer, the first thing that he did was always to give thanks. Only secondly, did he apparently pray for God's help, God's guidance in how to handle this situation now as well. So Daniel made no attempt to hide his devotion or dependence on God. That brings up then the third life lesson. And this life lesson is this, that Daniel's relationship with the Lord was not crisis oriented. He maintained a daily, consistent walk with God, just as every Christian is called to do. You know, some Christians have that kind of a relationship with God when the only time that they really pray or even think about God, is because there's some crisis in their life. It's a crisis-oriented kind of faith. And Daniel shows us that, yeah, there are plenty of crises in Daniel's life. 
This would have been a big one. <laughs> His life was at stake again. But it didn't change what he did. He prayed daily. He prayed consistently. He prayed throughout the day, if you will. And that's the kind of walk that Christ wants with us. That's not just when something happens in our life and we think about, oh, we better pray about this. It's that God wants to have a relationship with you that is regular, daily, hourly if possible even if it's just a fleeting thought about the Lord, something about His Word, something about His character, a thankfulness for whatever it is, that's the kind of relationship that God wants with us. Well, it leads fourthly to the prosecution then of Daniel. Beginning in verse 12, um, so they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, well, Daniel, who is one of those exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the current king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. <laughs> then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, remember your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no, edict, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace, spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. Now, apparently, his opponents knew where and when Daniel prayed, and so they went to his room, they found him praying, and as expected, they brought this accusation then against him. And they go to Darius, and they remind Darius of that decree, and especially of the penalty that went with it. Here was one of those exiles, they said, one of those Jews, one of those men that came from Judah so long ago, and he is breaking the law. He goes to his room and prays. He's not worshiping you. He's praying to his God. Now that puts Daniel or Darius in, in a very difficult position because now he's bound by his own unalterable decree. To his credit, Darius was greatly distressed by all this. Passage says basically that he did everything he could to avoid executing Daniel. But he knew he was trapped. He was trapped by his own law. He was trapped because he knew he couldn't change it. And finally, he's forced by the end of the day to give the order that Daniel be thrown into the lion's den for execution. As it was done, Darius seems to have offered either a prayer or some kind of a hope anyway that Daniel's God would rescue him from this certain death. I think that he certainly wanted to spare Daniel. I think that he respected Daniel. He respected him personally, certainly his administrative abilities, 
But he seems to be impressed with Daniel's confidence in God. He may have known about God's deliverance of Daniel's three friends so long before from that fiery furnace. But then he can't do anything else. He's thrown in, and in a sense, a large stone, some kind of a door, something is put over the entrance to seal it. And then, as he should, he seals it with wax and his signet ring, and not only his, but it says all of his nobles as well. They want to make sure that nobody's going to get in there and rescue him. Darius, it says, spent a sleepless night knowing, I think, that he had been tricked by his own officials at this point. I can only imagine some of the angst, some of the anger that was in his heart. Why did I ever allow them to talk me into this? Why in the world did I ever sign a decree of something like this? But he knows it can't be changed. Now let me give you a fourth life lesson that I think comes out of this part of the passage. It's a call to suffering. That every Christian must ultimately come to grips with the truth that the world hates them and will persecute them given the chance. And the reason is because the world hated Jesus Christ. Jesus told his disciples that very thing in the upper room, the night in which he was betrayed. He said to them, the world hates you, or hates me, and the world is going to hate you. And what he was saying was, you might as well just get used to it. The world at large does not like Christians, especially committed Christians, whose faith makes a difference in their life. The world hates that. And whenever given the chance, they will bring an accusation against you. They will try to trick you. They will cause suffering and pain in your life. And as we look at Daniel's situation here, we've got to come to that same position, come to grips with that and say, look, there's going to be suffering in our life that is unfair. <laughs> Jesus told us that it was going to be that way. Why would we think it was going to be any different? And when it comes, we need to understand why it's coming. It's becoming, it, it comes because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, fifthly, we see the preservation of Daniel. Verses 19 to 24. Verse 19, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lion's? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I done anything wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. So, at first light, at dawn, the king, who's had a sleepless light night now, gets up, he hurries to that place where this lion's den is. He wants to see what's happened. And when he gets there, he, he calls out to Daniel to see if he's still alive, hoping, maybe against all hope, that some way he is 
still there. That God had indeed rescued him. And then, to his astonishment, Daniel, I think in probably a very calm voice, replies that God had sent an angel to protect him, and he was unhurt. They pull him out, look him over. There's not a scratch on him. Not a claw mark, not a bite, nothing. He's perfectly fine. I don't know what happened. The passage doesn't tell us what happened. Whether all those lions cowered in fear, whether they, they all went to sleep. I don't know what happened. He might have been petting them for all we know. I don't know. But whatever it was, Daniel is absolutely fine. And then this kind of a difficult ending here, Darius's wrath falls on those officials and not only on them, but on their whole families as well. Kind of gruesome when you think about it. But you see, those were the guys that conspired, lied, and tried to trick Darius. So here's the fifth life lesson. When persecuted falsely, every Christian is called to trust God for deliverance, allowing God to do any retaliation. It wasn't Daniel who called for it. it. wasn't Daniel who, when he was elevated maybe above all of them, spent the next few years going through and cleaning them out. It wasn't Daniel that did any of that. God used Darius on the spot. Justice. Retaliation. In that way. But we need to understand that God is the one who rescues us from that persecution and suffering. Now, I couldn't put it all into one sentence, but it may not be the way we expect it. But it's still being rescued. God has a plan, a perfect plan for your life and the person sitting next to you and the next person and every one of us. God has a plan. And whatever that plan is, we can still trust his plan because there, even in that plan, is some kind of rescue as we trust him. We might not think it's the kind of rescue that we would like to have, but it's God's rescue and God's plan. And every Christian is called to trust God. Now the last set of verses here, 25 to 28, is the pronouncement of the king. We pick it up. <laughs> then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language and all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Look at that again. People must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, and this is where Cyrus comes in, and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So following the execution of Daniel's accusers, Darius, the very one whose earlier decree said that for a month, nobody could worship any other god. They had to worship and revere him. Now composes a new proclamation. <laughs> And this one declares that all people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Wow. Just like Nebuchadnezzar. What an amazing turnaround on Darius' part here. Here we have another one of those kings that worships idols. And he turns around and issues now a new decree about Yahweh, about God. 
And that's where the story ends. Daniel is honored. God is honored. And the world is right again, at least for a while. So let me give you a, a final, a final call. And in this case, it also serves as the summary for our entire story, our passage this morning. And it goes like this. Even when life is unfair and your suffering is undeserved, every Christian is called to let God use you to make himself known to others. Because that was the ultimate outcome of all this, when you think about it. I mean, Darius understood that, that the God that, that Daniel went and prayed to on a regular basis calls him his God. His God might have become Darius's God as well. We're not told exactly, but he has some really nice words about the living God here huh, that his kingdom will never be destroyed, that you need to worship him. And you see, this story, this Sunday school story, if you will, however fun to teach and nice to read, and you close the Bible and with a smile on your face and say, well, it wasn't that nice. Oh, it's a lot better than that. It's that God is trying to teach us these lessons. And life is not fair. It was not fair to Daniel. It won't be fair to you. But you know what? Even in the midst of that suffering, you are called to let God make himself known to other people through the way you react through what you say and what you do. That's the testimony that God wants you to have. That's the testimony that apparently Daniel had all of his life. And it comes out one more time in a story that we often know what happened, but we don't know why. Let's pray. Lord, it may come that we're privileged to meet Daniel in heaven. And when we do, we will talk to a man face to face who lived this life and trusted you in these kinds of situations. What an inspiration to us, even now. And it'd be my prayer for us for every man and woman, young person here this morning, that we would see this story and see the lessons that come out from it. All because you had a faithful servant named Daniel. Father, I pray that we would learn to trust in you, that we would learn to realize that when we're persecuted and we're unfairly accused of something, that we hold our ground, that we don't change things, that you are there and you'll make it right some way, some way. Father, all of that is to glorify you, to give you the testimony that is due your name. Father, help us to be those people that you want us to be. Help us to take away today at least one of these life lessons. And we pray in Christ's name. Soon. So will you pray with us, please? Heavenly Father, Lord, 
We're just overjoyed to have Gary and Mary with us here at Cornerstone. And what a beautiful church family we have here, Lord. And so we ask just for your, um, your blessing over them as they travel to Arizona, Lord. And we just ask that may their light shine for you down in Arizona. May you give them comfort knowing that their Cornerstone family is here for them. No matter what, always a phone call away, and we will continuously be praying for them, Lord. So we just ask for your blessing over them on this very day. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and close as we sing about how awesome our God is?